Good evening, everyone. We wanna welcome you to UT Southwestern Science Cafe. We welcome both our regulars and our new guests to this ongoing series. My name is Jenny King, and I'm part of the public affairs team here at UT Southwestern. We're in our third year of hosting Science Cafe, and we're proud to produce this series. On behalf of my colleagues, Joya Lang and Charlandra Thompson, as well as our guest speakers, Dr. Parsia Vagafi and Dr. Arjman Mufti, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Science Cafes are online conversations where our speakers take you on deep dives into science and health topics. At UT Southwestern, we are an academic medical center, which means we bring together research in the medical and health education, as well as patient care into one institution. Research and education and for inform care advancements quickly, which is a benefit to our patients and our community. We also have fun at Science Cafes while we learn. The format is casual and interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions and engage with us during the program. Please do use the chat feature. This evening, we are discussing liver transplantation from bench to bedside with Dr. Vagafi and Dr. Mufti, and more on them in just a moment. Before we begin, I have a few technical points to share. We are recording this program, and we're also live streaming it on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. Please mute your microphones to help with audio clarity for everyone. We also encourage you to leave your video on so we can see our Science Cafe community, especially during the Q&A portion of our program. And finally, just a reminder, while we cannot answer personal medical questions, we would love to hear from you with general questions on the topic of living liver transplantation. And with that, I'm so pleased to introduce our guest speakers. First, we have Dr. Parsia Vagafi. He is Professor of Surgery and Chief of the Division of Surgical Transplantation. Many of the patients he treats are facing extreme circumstances such as kidney or liver failure or cancer. And by using today's most advanced surgical techniques, Dr. Vagafi and his team are often able to see an immediate improvement in many patients, transforming their lives in the course of just a few hours. During Q&A, we will hear from Dr. Arjman Mufti. Dr. Mufti is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Medical Director of Liver Transplantation. He also is the Fellowship Program Director for Digestive and Liver Diseases. Dr. Mufti specializes in transplant hepatology and his primary area of research is acute chronic liver failure. Dr. Vagafi and Dr. Mufti, we're so glad you joined us this evening and welcome to Science Cafe. Dr. Vagafi, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Jenny. Um, let me... Uh... Share my screen here. We spent an hour beforehand practicing this, so I should be able to get it. One second here. Okay. Then I do this. Almost got it. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and just dive right in because there's already a lot of questions that we have to answer, it looks like. So um, uh, thanks for having us and thanks everyone for joining and um, you know, write down your questions and uh, Dr. Mufti and I hope we'll be able to address them uh, at the end of the talk. So I'm, uh, I'm Parsi Vagafi, as mentioned, and uh, I'm gonna talk about liver transplantation. Really, we're gonna talk about how liver transplant went from the lab to being this clinical endeavor that's now across the world. And now actually we're going back to the lab to, to refine it. And so we're gonna, we're gonna hit all those points in, um, in over the next hour. I don't have anything to disclose. Um, so this just gives you a sense of liver transplantation uh, in Texas. And uh, this is UT Southwestern. This is, we're here in the blue line. Um, you can see we've grown substantially as a liver transplant program over the last four years or so. Uh, where now we do about a hundred, uh, over a hundred liver transplants every year, um, and making us the largest program in DFW, uh, and also, you know, the program that has the best survival in, in DFW. And there's a lot of liver transplant programs um, in Texas, 
Um, and um, we're proud to lead this region in terms of both volume as well as quality. Um, you can see, you know, some of the stuff that we champion here at UT Southwestern. One of the things is our really short length of stay after a liver transplant. Um, you can see our length of stay is five days compared uh, to our region and across the country where that's uh, nearly doubled. Uh, and then a living donor transplant, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, where our length of stay is actually only four days for a living donor recipient uh, of a liver transplant. And, um, uh, you know, with our ICU colleagues uh, and, our, and our liver transplant anesthesia team, we've really developed novel protocols where um, you can see this is the percent of patients that we extubate at the end of a liver transplant in the operating room where over 90% of our liver transplants uh, now every year are extubated in the operating room, um, which leads to a short length of stay and saves a lot of money for, for everyone involved. So, um, and the question is, how do we get to this? How do we become uh, such an efficient and high volume program. And it's just not us. There's a lot of other programs, uh, about 140 liver transplant programs in the United States. Uh, and so how do we develop um, as, a, as a field? Um, so you have to go back a, a fair amount of time, um, 70 plus years, really. Um, Stuart Welch in Albany and Jack Cannon at UCLA in the mid 50s were really the, the first ones to begin doing uh, liver transplants in large animals, and they were doing liver transplants in, in dogs. And this is one of the original um, um, drawings from, from their work. And this is what we call a heterotopic liver transplant. So they were taking donor livers and placing them in the abdomen, but not removing the old liver. And so they're doing this to assess um, how, how they could do these, make these connections and how the liver would function uh, after liver transplant. And it would be um, a few more years, um, let's see, yeah, where um, Dr. Moore at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and Tom Starzl, who at the time was in Chicago and then later in Denver, would then begin what is classically described as an orthotopic liver transplant. Uh, that technique, um, my slides aren't advancing, let's see. There we go, uh, where um, the recipient of the liver, their old liver is removed and the new liver is placed in the same position. Um, and that is conventionally now what, uh, how we do a liver transplant even to this day, as much as they describe in, in the late 1950s. Again, these were transplants that they did in, in large animals. Um, and it would be a few more years when Dr. Starzl, uh, now at Denver, would do the first series of liver transplants in humans. Uh, and this is the first report in 1963 of the first three liver transplants that he performed. And, um, and you can see that back then, the first three patients, one was a three-year-old uh, who unfortunately uh, died on the table, um, a 48-year-old who died on post-op day 22, and then a 67-year-old who passed away on uh, seven and a half days after transplant. <clears throat> and, you know, I always, uh, when I first read this article, I was, I was, you know, a little surprised at why they would list seven and a half days as opposed to just seven days or, you know, round up to eight days. And, and if you think about it, what they were doing then was so novel that even a half day survival with the liver transplant was substantial at that time, because they were really measuring success uh, of a very novel technique. Um, um, and even achieving just a half day was, was important back then. And now, of course, uh, when you look at most liver transplant programs like ours, uh, 94, 95% of our liver transplant recipients survive to one year after transplant. And so we've come a long way over the last 70 years. Um, but uh, again, it was, it was a very big hill to climb uh, in the beginning. And you can see this is some data that was presented at a surgical meeting in the mid 90s. Um, we got better at not only doing the operation, but we got better at taking care of the patients in the OR, in the ICU, and also the immunosuppression that we give. And you can see that as we develop newer immunosuppressants to what we use today, tacrolimus, you could see that how the patient survival improved uh, dramatically with the, the advent of new immunosuppression. And so liver transplantation really started to take off as a modality 
uh, to treat patients with liver failure and patients with liver cancer. Um, and you can see it became even, uh, even in the scientific press, it, it gained a lot of steam because these, these are the number of publications related to liver transplantation. And really it, it took off in the late eighties and nineties as this became a much more frequent uh, procedure being performed. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the recipients uh, um, of a liver transplant. And this is really the main dilemma, um, even this, though this figure is from 10 years ago, this is still the main dilemma when we talk about transplantation of the liver or any other organ, quite frankly. There's a lot of people who are on the wait list and they're just not enough organs for everyone on the wait list. And there's this gap between supply and demand. And a lot of what we do, um, although we try to give a liver transplant to everyone who needs one, a lot of what we do is, is trying to find how we can expand the donor population to minimize this gap over time. And this is looking at that data with a little bit more granularity. You can see that um, these are the number of people added to the wait list for liver transplant every, every year uh, over a 15 year time period. And it's important to note that the green line is the number of transplants that are performed. And in the blue line, which is about a little over uh, 2,300 or so, 2,500 patients, these are the number of patients removed from the wait list, most of which are removed because they die waiting or, and they're too sick or they're too sick to receive a transplant at the time of the offer. So that's a substantial number of people who get on the wait list but can't achieve transplant. And this is what keeps us up at night. So when you're on the wait list, when you're on the wait list, how do we put people in terms of giving them a liver transplant and rank them? And we, what we do is we use what's called a MELD score. And the MELD score is a score that's um, calculated based upon lab values, your creatinine, your bilirubin, your INR, and now um, we use the sodium as well. And the MELD score, the higher the MELD score, it goes from six and it stops at 40. But the higher your MELT score, the higher the chance that you're going to have uh, death due to your liver disease within a three-month time period. And it, it, it was shown to be a very accurate way of capturing um, uh, death related to liver disease. And that's what's used to rank patients on the liver transplant wait list. And the, but the MELT score is not perfect. And over time, the MELT score started 20 years ago, actually, uh, February 2002. We've had to refine the MELD score over time. Um, and we, we're now going to, actually there's a new version that's gonna be proposed with some more tweaks and changes so that we can more accurately um, predict and list patients for liver transplant. It's important to note that um, there, is, there are differences um, in supply and demand across the country. Uh, the United States is broken up into 11 regions in terms of how organs are, are um, uh, dispersed and transplanted. And uh, we're in region four. These are the, the, uh, the MELD scores um, that you find in region four. But th there was a, a large variation in MELD scores at transplant across the country. So someone in region five, let's say San Francisco, would have to have a very high MELD score in order to get a liver transplant because there's so many people waiting. Whereas someone um, in region three, which is the southeast of the United States, like Florida, they would not have to wait as long or they would, have a, they would not have to have as high a MELD score in order to achieve transplant. So there was this disparity across the country. Um, and this was um, really came to the public's eye um, almost 10 years ago when a lot of press was surrounding the liver transplant that Steve Jobs received. And if you remember Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, although he lived in Palo Alto, California, he traveled to Memphis, Tennessee in order to receive a liver transplant because of the supply demand issue. Um, and in order to achieve a transplant, that's what he had to do. Um, and we looked at this we, uh, when I was in Boston prior to coming down to Dallas, we looked at people who would travel in order to get a liver transplant. And what we saw is that as you sat on the wait list longer, you were more likely to start looking for another place to get a liver transplant. And if you looked, most people traveled 
to locations where there was a shorter time period to get a liver transplant. And so people would travel to region three. As I mentioned, this is, this is the UNOS map. You can see that's Florida, Georgia, Alabama, et cetera. And then or region 10, which was uh, in this area here and 11, which was the Virginias and Memphis, Tennessee, et cetera. And so, and people would travel from areas like New England or uh, California or New York, where again, a, there were a lot more people on the wait list and less donors available. And the problem with this was the people who really benefited from the ability to travel were a distinct group of people um, that were, that tend to be Caucasian, college edu educated, privately insured. And so really there was the disparity um, uh, really uh, emerge that really need to be addressed. Um, and so a lot of discussions happen about how can we make the system more fair so more people have access and there's not so much a discrepancy between supply and demand. And these are some of the original articles that started showing up in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. Um, and this shows the MELD scores uh, across the country. And you can see how different they are. All the colors are different MELD score required to get a liver transplant. And then it, it started becoming very uh, public in the press, a fight brewing over liver donation, who gets dibs on transplanted livers. And so the, the, the regulatory bodies in transplant just really sat down and started having meetings about how can we redesign the system so that the most number of people could benefit. Um, and it became a very uh, heated discussion. Um, you know, this is some of the stuff that was in, in the papers that the Southeast and Northwest states, New York and California want to take your livers, you know, in terms of where the livers were going to go. And so it became a very heated discussion. Uh, liver transplant plan could punish donor rich South. Um, so, you know, the, the, the press uh, really took off with this. And so, but um, the system persevered and we worked through it. And what, we, what, came out of it was a new system which just went into effect, you know, even though we started this discussion about 10 years ago, it just really took effect um, last year. Um, and what that did was, we talked about the different regions uh, in the United States. What the new system allowed was that a liver could travel across regions, across a broader area. So now a liver could travel up to 500 miles, and you wouldn't have to stay within your region. If you were living in South Carolina and you needed a liver, you wouldn't have to just stay within region 11. If there was a liver available for you in Florida and that's within 500 miles, you would have access to that based upon your MELD score. And so after all the debate, um, what we did see, these are some of the uh, changes that took place with the new system. We saw that Actually, transplants went up by 5% over this past year. We saw people get who have the higher MELD scores get transplanted at a much higher rate, right? We want the sickest people to get transplanted more quickly. We saw fewer people removed from the wait list due to death or being too sick. And of course, we saw that livers traveled further, right? There was, um, the, because we increased it to 500 miles, we saw that livers would have to travel further uh, to get to their intended recipient, but it really didn't make that much difference in terms of how long the liver sat on ice. It was really a matter of only 22 minutes, even though they were traveling um, a much further distance. A little bit about the donors then, right? We talked about the recipients and how they're on the list based upon MELD score and the new system that we have to get more livers to people. But what about donors? And, and why do we need more donors, right? Well, the reason is because we, we can, are continually progressing as a field and being able to offer liver transplant to more and more people. What we thought was a contraindication 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago, maybe now is not a contraindication. So you see liver transplantation for new types of uh, cancers in the liver or um, for patients with HIV or patients with uh, have uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis, um, or even now, um, uh, we're seeing liver transplantation um, for patients with colorectal cancer. This was the Cleveland Clinic did the first transplant in January 2018. 
In fact, we uh, now have an approved protocol at UT Southwestern as well for liver transplantation for patients with colorectal cancer that have had metastatic disease go to their liver. And so we are constantly finding um, new indications to help patients with liver disease or liver cancer. And so, of course, there's going to be a, a need for more donors uh, um, in, in the United States. And so if you look at the different types of donors in the United States, the vast majority are, re are what we term uh, brain dead donors. These are patients uh, who have suffered an injury that has resulted in brain death and they or their family have elected to donate their organs. And, and um, there's also a smaller proportion of um, higher risk transplants that we perform. And those are ones that we're gonna talk about uh, today, this evening. And those are one category called a cardiac death donor, DCDs, and living donor liver transplantation, as well as split liver transplantation. And um, cardiac death donation are, are donors that have suffered um, a severe injury, and it's not expected that they're going to recover, but they don't meet the exact criteria of brain death. And um, their family or uh, chooses to allow them to proceed to donation. Um, and therefore they're removed from life support and then their organs are donated. Um, those organs have a higher risk of having certain types of complications, um, depending on how, um, how long it takes for the, the uh, donor to pass away at the time of removal of life support. And so uh, a, a large part of our research focus has been on how to, to better um, um, fix those organs prior to transplant. And one part of those is what we call liver perfusion. Um, and this is, you know, traditionally, this is Tom Starzl. And, uh, you know, back in the day when they would, and still today for a large part, when a liver is removed uh, from the donor, it's placed on ice and it's transported on ice to the recipient. Liver perfusion uh, these are some of the various devices that are either FDA approved now or in the process of being FDA approved. The liver is placed on a machine and it's pumped with blood and nutrients and oxygen so that as to mimic as if it was in within the human body. And you can imagine um, that being in that environment with, with warm oxygenated blood and nutrients minimizes damage to the organ and allows it to be transplanted more easily. And more importantly as well, they can also serve as a platform to really test and see because you can, you can draw blood and, and check lab values off these machines. Is this liver gonna be usable? And so it, it's not only a way to preserve the liver but also potentially a way to assess the liver whether it's gonna be suitable for transplant. So as you start using more and more livers which you would think perhaps are marginal or uh, on that spectrum, then you now have a device that can help you decide, is this gonna be a suitable liver for transplant? Um, and um, what we saw is, and this is the, the trial that was just published, um, and we were uh, part of the trial, and um, Dr. McNamara, who was one of our surgeons here, was um, um, the, the principal investigator of the trial. And this is the enrollment from all the centers. UT Southwestern was the second biggest center involved in the trial. And what we saw that the livers that were placed on the device had significant reduction in damage to the organ. Um, and they had reduced rates of complications like early allograft dysfunction or complications from the bile duct connections. And what we saw also was an expansion of using more marginal liver transplants. Um, and, you know, the hopes is with further research, we can take livers that we otherwise would discard, place them on the machine, and hopefully improve them so that they can be used, then, you know, expanding the population of, of donors available. And importantly, maybe we put it on the machine and we identify a liver that shouldn't be used, right? Because we don't want to, we don't want to do those transplants. Um, so this is a, a growing technology. It's really starting to take off. And so and we'll, you know, we'll see where this goes in the future, but uh, UT Southwestern is um, heavily participating in this type of research. Let's talk a little bit about partial liver transplantation now. Um, there's, a, there's a poll question up. Um, true or false, living donor liver transplantation is possible 
do the ability of the liver to regenerate. So um, as that comes in, let me just talk about, uh, so partial liver transplantation. Now this can be from a donor that is deceased or it can be from a living donor. And we're gonna talk about how that's possible. And for those of you that answered, are people still answering? Okay, we're sharing. 84% said true and 84% are correct. So the liver is the organ in the body that can regenerate. And so, um, and one of the, the famous French liver surgeons said, um, you know, uh, anatomically the liver is a pair organ. For one donor, ideally, we have to distribute two livers as two kidneys, right? You have two separate kidneys, and that's what allows us to take one kidney out and donate to someone. The liver is a little bit more complex because you have one liver, but it can be split into two. And it's, it's very challenging surgery to do, but it can be done. And we're going to talk about it a little bit. So this really evolved. Um, primarily initially to address the issue of how do we transplant a small child, right? Most of the um, donors uh, in the country are adults and those livers are big. They're adult sized livers. How do you transplant a child? And so what was developed over time was a concept, okay, we, you could take a, a whole liver and take a piece of it and give that to a child. And that was started in 1984 by Bismuth and, and a German surgeon, Brolsch. And then it was a few years later where, where the thought was, we can take the whole liver from the deceased donor and why don't we split it so that we can use both pieces, the big piece for the adult, the small piece for the child. And that led then to the concept of, if we can do that, why not someone be able, a living person, donate a piece of their liver to a child? And that was done in 1990 by Strong in Australia. And then again, another progression in 1994, where Yamaoka took the big piece out of a living donor and used that for an adult. And so there's this natural progression of surgical technique and concepts that allowed us uh, to, to make that progression to where we can do living liver donation. And so this is what a liver looks like within a human body that's now, been, the liver has been split. And you can see um, this is what we call an in situ split. It's, it's being split while in the body and the, the blood vessels uh, are still attached here. But the uh, what I tell people is the liver is like a townhouse. You have a three-story townhouse, that's the adult side, and you have a two-story townhouse, that's the, the children's side. They share a common wall, but they have their own plumbing and electricity and everything. And the, the challenge is you gotta split that townhouse right down the middle just, and that's how you split a liver without putting any holes on either side of the walls. And so it's, it's a little bit challenging. The other way you can split a liver from a deceased donor is you can take out the entire liver <clears throat> and you can take pictures of it um, once it's out of the body and look at the blood vessels and the bile ducts. And you can then split it when it's sitting on ice. And this is what we call an ex vivo uh, split liver transplant. And you can see we're splitting that, that common wall between the adult side and the pediatric side. And this is what you get. You get a big piece that goes into an adult. Then you get a small piece that fits nicely into a child. And this is what it looks like once it's put back in the body. This is the adult piece again. So um, that is splitting a liver from a deceased donor. What about living donor liver transplantation? So let me give you a case uh, where this was a 58 year old gentleman with alcoholic cirrhosis who presented October, 2015 with lower extremity swelling and ascites, a scrotal edema. He underwent an ultrasound and it showed cirrhosis and he had uh, some liver lesions. And one of them was a very large tumor, six and a half centimeter tumor that we saw in MRI. And at that time, this tumor um, was considered too big to receive a, a transplant from a deceased donor. So his only option was to receive a transplant from a living donor. So um, a 27 year old male presented in January, 2017 for consideration of liver donation to his future father-in-law. This was this gentleman's future son-in-law, young, healthy, who came forward. We, we took pictures of his liver. He had great anatomy. 
his liver was big enough where it would be a good size for the recipient, but also would leave with him enough, right? We want to leave enough within the donor as well. And so um, this is what that looks like. This is this young man's surgery. We've split the liver again. Now, it, this is the, the big side that's going to go into the, um, and this is what another, this is another picture of it being split. Again, the blood vessels are still attached. They haven't been divided yet. And this is it when it comes out and we flush it, put it on ice, bring it next door and then put it into the, take the recipient's old liver out and then put the new liver in. And that's, that's a living donor liver transplant. This is this young man who donated to his future father-in-law. And then this is a few months later at, at the wedding um, when um, they got, um, they were married. I think it was two or three months later and they were already on the dance floor uh, at the wedding. And you know, it's nice for follow-up. This is, I just got this card um, last month. This was their fifth year anniversary. And um, now uh, Nick has a daughter and he's a grandfather two times over now. So there's really benefit. Now it's, it's risky. It's a risky operation, but right. This is a totally healthy young man. That's going to undergo a major operation. And we have to make sure that, you know, there's enough liver for the recipient, but we leave Nick with enough liver for the rest of his life. And with that, hopefully with no complications. And as I mentioned, we've developed this program at UT Southwestern. We did our first living donor liver transplant in November, 2019. Uh, this is um, a daughter donating to her mother. And uh, you know, we have a great team here, Dr. Hanish, our head of liver transplant. Dr. Marrero, who, who was here now at the University of Pennsylvania, but was the head of liver transplant at the time. And Dr. Mufti, uh, who's, who's taken on that role now. Um, and this is of course, um, a, a year later, um, um, everyone's doing great. So um, living donor liver transit, we talked about the risk. And so, um, you know, if you look at the number of transplants performed, when you look at all these, you know, uh, types of donors, overall, they don't make up a large population of, of donors yet. And so we have to grow with technology and uh, we have to grow these things. And so there is risk with living donation. Um, you can see in 2001, we hit a peak of over 500 living donors uh, in the country. Unfortunately, there was a donor that died in, in New York um, in that year. And you could see the, the enthusiasm for living donation decrease substantially. And it decreased even further. In 2010, there were actually two donors that died within the same year, um, again, at, at very high volume programs. Um, very experienced teams, um, because at the end of the day, there's no surgery that's not without risk. And so um, it's taken a long time, but living, uh, living donor liver transplant now has finally in 2019 re regained back to the level it was at nearly 20 years prior. Um, and so uh, more and more centers are, are being involved and um, and uh, getting more patients transplanted across the country. When you, when you talk about the risk again, you know, you can donate the right side of the liver, the big piece, that's 60% usually of the donor liver or the left side is 40%. And there's a little bit more risk um, uh, with donating the right side because it's, it's a bigger piece that's coming out of the donor. Um, and donating the left side, the, the risk of dying is much smaller. Uh, it's similar to donating a kidney. Um, but again, is, is that left side going to be enough for the recipient is, is the question. Now, there are teams that have taken it a further step, right? If, if donating the left side is less risky, some places have taken two donors and taken the left side from two donors and put them into one recipient. And this is depicted in this um, drawing here. Um, this is not that common, but this is actually uh, has been done. It was reported um, and, and it's been done by a few centers, um, um, not in the United States, uh, but in other countries. And again, with the thought being, if you can have two people donate a smaller piece, that's less risky for each of those donors. But then you have to think, well, now you have three people involved in an operation when before it was just two. So 
um, there's, there's still risk involved. So um, as I mentioned now, we've come a long way. We've looked at donors, we've looked at recipients, um, and we've seen all the clinical success that we've had in liver transplantation. You know, what is the, the future of liver transplantation? Um, and this is where we have to go back to the bench. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the perfusion device, but that's now a clinical reality. So what's really the next hurdle? And it's really, you know, what we call xenotransplantation. And so the, the poll question is asking you, what is the ideal, uh, true or false, the pig is considered to be the ideal source for xenotransplantation. And um, we're still going and 82% say the pig and 82% are correct. Um, and so this is depicted in this cartoon. We can go two ways here, either a baboon's heart and a pig's liver or a pig's heart and a baboon's liver. And so the answer is actually a pig. And um, I'm sure most of you heard um, of this in the, in the lay press uh, just this year. Um, this gentleman, David Bennett, uh, received the uh, first uh, heart from a pig and lived for two months with that pig heart and unfortunately succumbed. And that, um, but still a, a significant milestone in, in the journey of xenotransplantation. Um, so um, what are the advantages of using pigs for organs? Well, um, they're available. Um, they are not that expensive. Um, they breed fairly quickly. So you can generate a lot of pigs very quickly. Um, and they're very distant from us, um, um, which has disadvantages, right? Because of the compatibility with humans. And the other disadvantage is that we have natural antibodies to some of the proteins and sugars that pigs display. And so, but when you look at the waiting list growing and the number of donors that we have, the number of transplants we perform, again, the same type of chart we saw before, we need to have another source of organs. And, you know, xenotransplantation is thought to be that next step. So what, what do we know about um, liver xenotransplantation, okay, in terms of taking a pig liver and putting it into a human? Well, these experiments actually started um, back in the 60s as well, when the first liver transplants were being done. This is Sir Roy Kahn, again, with Tom Starzl. Tom Starzl is like the father of liver transplantation, if not the, one of the fathers of transplantation. So and Tom Starzl said, if rejection were avoided, it is yet to be shown whether a primate's health can be maintained with the hepatic metabolism of a pig. And because back then the pig liver would only survive on a matter of hours. And they got one pig liver to survive in a baboon up to three and a half days. So again, um, early results that were not promising in terms of going forward. There, there was one case um, of a pig liver being used in a human, and that was published um, back in 1995. And there was a young woman in California with, um, whose liver had fulminant liver failure. So uh, was, was dying of severe acute liver failure. And um, a pig liver was placed in her in the heterotopic position again. So it was placed in her, but her native liver was left in. And she received a variety of treatments all in the attempt in order to maintain her alive until a human liver could become available. And they thought that the liver was working a little bit, but unfortunately she um, developed uh, brain death while waiting for a human liver and she was unable to get a human liver in time. But this was actually the first description and only of a, of a pig to human liver transplant until um, the, the, these recent reports in, in the news. Um, so when you look at all the experiments that have been done in putting pig livers uh, in um, baboons or monkeys, all the results are, were reported in terms of hours because it just was so hard to get the liver to last longer than that. And a lot of this was just the incompatibilities. You would put the liver in and the platelets would drop very quickly. Then you would see bleeding. And then you would start seeing clotting in all the organs. And so it was just a vicious cycle that was occurring um, and, and the animal would succumb in a matter of hours to days. The most that uh, people got out was about seven days. 
we developed a system where we said, okay, what if we gave uh, human coagulation factors to the baboon at the time of the transplant? Could we get the liver to survive longer? And what we did, is, uh, we did show is that we were able to get a baboon to live for 25 days with a pig liver. And so for the first time, we showed that the pig liver, aside from the coagulation factors, was able to sustain a baboon's life. And then we repeated and we were able to get a pig liver to last up until almost a month, 29 days. And you can see these are the liver function tests, which look great up until the baboon um, succumbed. And so we really showed for the first time that a pig liver can sustain the life of a non-human primate if we can get over some of these um, incompatible barriers. And again, you can see from 1968, where we couldn't get beyond five days, to 2016, 17, where we're getting up to a month survival. And it reminds you of those initial descriptions of the human liver transplants, where they were surviving up to seven and a half days in those descriptions. And now uh, we have so much more success and maybe now we're seeing that success in terms of um, xenotransplant. So a, a large part of why um, pigs are the ideal source is because they can be genetically edited very easily. Now with new technology called you know, CRISPR technology, you can really alter the genes within a pig. You can insert human genes. You can remove genes that maybe are, are detrimental, like uh, one gene called PERV, porcine um, retrovirus gene, that uh, you can take those types of genes out um, in order to make the organ more suitable for a human. And so a large part of the work now being done is trying to make the pig organ more compatible for the human. And it's thought, you know, the, the concept that you hear from the, uh, the teams involved in this type of research now and the companies involved is, this is a description, you know, a, a drawing, but the concept of having these hubs where um, uh, pig organs would be removed and, and then transported to transplant centers to be placed into recipients. Um, and so um, that, you know, is definitely in the future but um, it might not be that far away. So uh, to conclude, liver transplant, as we talked about, it really began in the lab. It began with experiments, but then it expanded rapidly into clinical application. We had improved immunosuppression. We had technical advances. We had improved critical care. We had really a multidisciplinary approach that allowed us to achieve all the success. But now we're back. We're still with the same dilemma. We have a lot of people waiting and not enough organs. And so we're back to the lab and trying to figure out how we can make more organs available for people so that we can transplant as many people as possible. Thanks everyone for joining and uh, we look forward to answering some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vagafi. If you could unshare your screen so that way we can see everyone, I'm gonna jump right in to the Q&A portion of the session. Um, first, I'm going to address Dr. Mufti, um, Dr. Vagafi, feel free to chime in wherever you see fit. We had quite a few questions submitted ahead of time, and then we've also been getting lots of questions in the chat, so keep those coming. Our first one, someone says, I understand that a donor may, able, may be able to donate a part of the liver. If so, what does it mean for the donor's life going forward? Could you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, thank you again for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here, and Hopefully this will be helpful for everyone um, who's um, joined us both here and I guess on Twitter as well. Um, so when people are selected for living donor liver transplantation, uh, uh, donors will go through a very thorough evaluation. So obviously we want them to be healthy. And one of the questions um, that has been posed is why is 55 the upper age, of, uh, upper age limit for living donors? We want donors to be healthy and we want them to ab be able to go through as Dr. Vogfi already described, a surgery that is not trivial to say the least and have excellent long-term outcomes. Um, and so uh, what we know is that um, we have talked about the liver growing back or regenerating. It grows back in both the patient, i.e. the recipient who receives uh, the, the larger proportion of the liver and in the donor, the donor uh, who's donating the liver. Um, and uh, we know that um, 
for example, um, are the long-term outcomes, um, there is there has not been shown to be any long-term outcome in terms of a shortening of life expectancy uh, in, uh, donor, in donors who donate livers. That's great news. Uh, someone actually asked, how long after transplant can I go to work? So that's a really good question. So we typically tell patients they should be ready to take between two to three months off. So looking at overall data, about 50% of patient donors are back at one month about 75% are back at two months and 100% of donors are back at three months. Um, obviously, you know, um, the idea, everyone is a little bit different um, and the type of work that people do can be different. Um, so we, uh, anywhere from one to three months, but really it's around two months for the majority of patients. It's a relatively quick recovery time. Um, how long, let's see. Why is the liver the only organ that regenerates? Is, is that true? And if so, why, what makes the liver so special? Well, I mean, I, I had a, if I had a million dollar you know, million dollars uh, to answer that in terms of we wish the brain would regenerate. Obviously, you know, our skin, for example, we have multiple layers and where you get scar tissue in the skin, but skin grows back. The idea is just a, a facet of the liver. And we know, for example, that the liver is an area where Blood from, the gut, blood from the gut is going to the liver. So the liver is a, a source of lots of action and lots of what we call metabolic activity. And the liver has more, over 200 functions, just to put it very mildly, and you could enumerate more than that even. Um, and so the liver is an organ where the cells, there is regeneration and growth taking place all the time. Uh, so for example, in patients who have uh, damage to the liver due to, for example, medications or drug-induced liver injury, we know in those patients uh, the liver will grow back um, and the liver has the ability to turn over very, very quickly. Um, and so happily for us, it does regenerate. Uh, and with living donor liver transplantation, we know that it, you know, in the vast, in the liver will grow back to 90 to 100% of its original size um, um, within a few months. Uh, what we know, and someone asked us, if we take the right lobe, does the light right lobe grow back? The right lobe per se cannot grow back, but in terms of volume, it grows back to close to its original size. Thank you. What is a domino liver transplant? So we've actually done a domino liver transplant here, and I don't know, Pasia, if you want to address that. Um, sure. Um, so a domino liver transplant is uh, when someone has a, a form of liver disease that doesn't result in um, their liver failing, but does necessitate them getting a new liver, uh, such as um, for amyloid uh, disease, what comes to mind in the adult population, that liver can um, of that person with amyloid can be transplanted into someone else because the, um, the effects of amyloid take decades uh, to manifest. And so someone who needs a liver transplant can receive that amyloid liver. And then the person um, with amyloid uh, receives a, a whole organ liver transplant uh, from a deceased donor. So that's a, a domino. So one liver goes to one person, another liver goes to another person. So. Right. And, and those patients, we carefully select who would, is eligible for a domino liver. So for example, the example that Dr. Bogfi just described, we're able to take that liver because the liver is the source of amyloid. So for that patient, when we remove the liver, amyloid is no longer being produced by that liver, but it may take 40 or 50 years to get complications related to amyloid. So if we then give that domino liver to a 70 year old recipient, for example, they would have to live to 120 to have meaningful complications of amyloidosis. And uh, so the, the likelihood of that occurring is extremely unlikely to say the least. Thank you. Are there any risk factors that are known to cause a delay in recovery post transplant? Yes, and this is one of the reasons that we talk about living donor liver transplantation. Essentially, liver tra patients who require liver transplant can get very, very sick. Um, and so the sicker you are, as a rule of thumb, the sicker you are going into transplant, the longer it will take you to recover. The more malnourished patients can get um, and the more complications you have beforehand, 
you know, if you have multiple infections, for example, if you're admitted multiple times with confusion or hepatic encephalopathy from liver disease, that can then means that you go into transplant sicker. Transplant is obviously a major un undertaking and a major operation. And then recovery afterwards can take longer because you're more debilitated. Uh, there are obviously other things that contribute, um, you know, post-transplant complications, um, such as bleeding after transplant, infections after transplant, et cetera. But really, it really starts when you are diagnosed with liver disease. The idea is to get you to transplant as healthy, being as healthy as possible. And one of the advantages of living donor liver transplantation is that, as Dr. Vargafi was talk, uh, describing, we have more people who need a liver transplant than we have organs available. So the chances of a person, and we talk about liver transplantation as a two-step process. The first step is you want to get on the waiting list, but the, the second step is actually getting a liver. And just because you're at step one, you're not guaranteed to get to step two. And in fact, up to 25%, you, know, you may have a chance, a one in four chance of dying whilst waiting on the waiting list as someone who's waiting for a transplant. So what that means is that we want to get people to transplant as being as healthy as possible. And therefore that's where living donor comes in because it's, it's a cert, once you find a donor, we can schedule the surgery and we don't have to wait for you to get extra sick. The other thing is in order to go higher up uh, with, with a higher MELD score, you have to get sicker. And so you are, with liver transplantation, you have to be at this nexus where you're sick enough for transplant, but not too sick for transplant because your MELD score needs to be competitive because the way organ allocation works is the MELD score is between six and 40. And it's not like kidney transplantation where it's done by time because we have dialysis for kidney patients. We don't have dialysis for liver disease. So the allocation is done by how sick you are. So if your MELD is 40 and you're at the top of the list, if an organ becomes available, you know, the person with a MELD score of 40 is the one who would be the first person eligible. So if your MELD score is 20 or 25, but you're still sick from liver disease, that liver may never get to you. And so the longer you have to wait, the sicker potentially you can get on the list and the greater the complications that you can have post-surgery, post-transplant. How does one get on the list or the waiting list? Is it something that you would do with your doctor or? So you have to be referred, number one, obviously diagnosed with liver disease and referred to a transplant center. Uh, once you're referred to a transplant center, you'll undergo a thorough evaluation and you would meet someone like me as the transplant hepatologist. You would meet uh, someone like Dr. Vargavi as the transplant surgeon and a multidisciplinary team. It's not just one person, it's a whole team. So we have uh, you'll meet with the social worker, the, uh, with the nutritionist uh, that you would see here. And we have a transplant psychologist as well uh, that sees patients. And you would undergo a thorough evaluation. Obviously, liver transplantation is a major undertaking and major surgery. So your heart has to be strong enough. So you would undergo uh, a thorough evalu cardiac evaluation. Um, and once you've been seen by the whole team, uh, a transplant committee will then meet uh, and look at all the data and decide if someone meets criteria for liver transplantation. And once you're approved for transplant, you are then on the transplant waiting list. So the first step is get referred to a transplant center and then you undergo evaluation. And then if you meet certain criteria, which can be different for different types of diseases, then you're placed on the waiting list. Thank you. With living donations, can a donor donate more than once? Oh, <laughs> you have to know. Actually Yes and no. So, Go ahead, pause it. Um, you can only donate once on the liver part. Um, and you can only donate once if you're donating kidney. But we do have a, a very small number of people who donate a piece of liver and later donate a, a kidney. And actually, we're, we're about to do one where someone has donated their kidney previously and is now donating part of their liver. Yeah. Very generous people. Yes. And that's the one, one thing we always tell people when we talk about living donor liver transplantation, you will always be amazed at people's generosity and sort of how good people can be. Um, and so one of the things people are always worried about is how do I go and ask someone, hey, can you donate part of your liver? Um, the first thing is we always say it never hurts to ask. You'll have to tell them that you need a liver transplant. You don't have to tell them the nature of your liver disease, but tell them you need a transplant. 
The second part is the benefits of living donor liver transplantation, which are that, you know, it, uh, it prevents you from getting too sick before transplantation. The second part is it reduces your chance of dying on the waiting list, and it can result in a, a quicker recovery. And the outcomes of living donor are at least as good as deceased donor liver transplantation, uh, if not just slightly better. Um, and so, and so ne never be afraid to ask. Um, and, you know, we can help people um, in terms of trying to craft a message about how they can um, make that appeal. Um, and social media can be used for lots of negative things, but social media can definitively be used for good uh, when it comes to asking and soliciting for living donation. The one thing I should add, obviously, is that we can never have monetary benefit for a donor for liver transplantation because that's essentially organ trafficking and highly illegal. Um, so both of you are surgeons. What is the most challenging part of the surgery? Much as I would like to be a surgeon, I am not a transplant surgeon. I'm a transplant hepatologist. So I will, I will defer to Dr. Margafi on that question. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's complex surgery. You know, the liver is a very vascular organ. It has two blood vessels that go in and it has one blood, major blood vessel that dr drains everything. So it's a very uh, vascular organ. Um, and so you have to be very careful when you're doing a liver transplant in a recipient because the re recipient um, often has a lot of clotting issues because of liver failure. And then when you're doing a living donor and you're splitting liver, you have to be very careful because it's a very vascular organ and you have to make all these, um, um, you, you have to preserve everything exactly how it's needed for the, trans, the future transplant, but also be careful not to damage anything in the donor. And so um, that's what makes it very challenging. It's very delicate surgery. And the last question I'm gonna take from the chat uh, is about preventative measures. What would you recommend just to the average person who wants to avoid uh, ever needing a liver transplant as much as we know now that we've got a great team of friendly folks who we could come see, um, what would you recommend? So I think, you know, this is obviously a very complex question uh, and this doesn't just relate to liver, liver transplantation, but it relates to other complications. The fastest indication for liver transplantation or the fastest growing indication um, and the fast growing and the number one cause of liver disease in the Western world and increasingly across the world is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what we've seen is this explosion in obesity, the obesity epidemic uh, in the United States and in the West. Um, but that doesn't just mean liver disease. Um, it is associated with increased risk of heart disease. It's associated with an increased risk of cancer. Um, and so really in terms of, there are some very simple things. One is obviously um, uh, sort of, the things that result in complications would be uh, increased obesity. So uh, because we have the diet in the, U in the West has changed, it's very calorie rich and calorie dense. Um, and so weight uh, is an important factor that with attendant complications such as diabetes, type two diabetes, hypertension um, and other complications associated with it. So that's number one. Number two is we've also recently, and with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, seen a, a, an increase in alcohol use in the United States. Um, and in fact, as the number of transplants uh, being done for hepatitis C has decreased, the number of transplants being done for alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis has increased significantly over the last two years. So it's really, there's nothing per se regarding the liver, but it's just healthy living, you know, exercise, um, because that's associated with improved cardiovascular health, um, monitor your weight uh, for weight gain. Uh, and if you have other complications, so if you have type two diabetes, make sure your diabetes is well controlled. If you have hypertension or high blood pressure, make sure your blood pressure is well controlled. Um, if you have high cholesterol, make sure you're taking medications to control your cholesterol. Um, so really common sense measures uh, a lot of the time. Um, and then obviously in terms of alcohol intake, um, uh, monitor the amount of alcohol that you drink. Um, and what we know is that binge drinking, for example, is significantly more harmful to the liver than um, if you drank the same amount, but uh, spread it out. I'm not advocating spreading out a large amount over time, but uh, we know that binge drinking, which again has increased, um, is, uh, can be more harmful. 
I'm sorry, my light keeps on turning off, so I'm just going to turn it back on. Thank you both. I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Valgathy and Dr. Mufti, for such an enlightening conversation about transplantation, living liver donors, and your research. And I know we have more questions than we can even answer, um, but we appreciate you. We appreciate all of our guests. Joya, thank you for your um, great help tonight. Uh, we wanna mention to everyone, we're gonna be putting some links in the chat uh, that we have a slight change from our regular schedule. Next week, we have a special program on autism on uh, Thursday the 31st. And then after that, on Monday, we have a, a Zoom community conversation at noon on mental health counseling, um, our pediatrics residency, and the nonprofit Cafe Momentum, which some of you may know about. And after that, the next Science Cafe will be about the science of coughing on Thursday, April 14th. So we hope you'll join us, be looking for our newsletter with all the registration links, or you can click right now. Um, on behalf of everyone tonight, our faculty, speakers, and our, you all, our guests, thank you for joining us. We wish you good health and wellness and a good night. We are adjourned.